Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Willy Brink. Um, and so Willy did his MSc at Stellenbosch. He then subsequently completed his PhD in Sheffield, um, focusing on 3D reconstruction for face recognition. So a bit like the Microsoft Connect, before that was a thing. Um, he was then a researcher at MIAS, which is a division at the CSIR. Um, and he's now a senior lecturer at Stellenbosch, um, as well as the head of the applied mathematics department there. Um, and finally, he is, of course, one of the main deep, deep learning in DARBA founders. Uh, so please help me welcome Vili Brunk. Uh, thanks very much, and uh, I also just want to thank the organizers. Uh, I think they put up a really amazing event, and uh, we know how much work that is, so uh, thank you very much for that. All right, um, so this talk is going to be um, kind of an overview of the type of stuff me and my group are doing. I um, run a computer vision research group at Stellenbosch, um, and... Um, as you can see there in the subtitle, uh, this is going to be mostly an introduction and a sort of a, an idea of the type of th things you can do with uh, visual semantic embeddings. It's um, also something that's relatively new in our group. We recently decided that we want to start incorporating language models into uh, the computer vision stuff that we're doing. Um, so uh, I'm not going to show you lots of fancy results, more just the idea of um, this and uh, sort of our plans for, for what we can do with it. Okay. Um, so just an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to start sort of on the vision side of things with um, uh, representation learning, which I think is, is quite well known in this group. Um, then I'll say something about attributes and relations, and then I'll uh, just um, move over to the language side of things, so with word embeddings, um, and then uh, we'll see how we can combine them. Um, and I'll mention a few applications, okay. And on the bottom there, you can kind of see what the idea is. So we have an image of a blue car. Uh, if we subtract the word blue and add the word red in, some, in this embedding space, uh, is it possible to get a, a, a retrieve an image of a, of a red car, okay. Okay, there's kind of a rule in computer vision that you have to uh, talk about cats and dogs, right? That's just how it works. <laughs> so there's... There's my version of it. Um, so this is like the classical image classification problem. You have a bunch of images labeled dog. You have a bunch of images labeled cat. And now you want to learn this, uh, or you, you want to train this system to be able to label a new image as, as either of those two labels. And uh, of course, the standard way to do that is with a convolutional neural network. Uh, so you have this hierarchy of uh, convolutions typically in the beginning. And that is followed by a few fully connected layers um, at the end. And uh, if you want to write down some mathematics for that, so we have a model that should take an input x, this is an image, uh, to a, one of these, um, let's see if this, so this is like the one hot encoded vectors for all the classes. Um, so this model is supposed to map an image to a, a one hot uh, vector. And we uh, are, of course, interested in what are the parameters that will do this in the best possible way. So we have this cost function um, that is to be minimized over the uh, parameter space. OK. Um, and of course, as I'm sure you know, uh, people have discovered that what pops out after all those convolutions, so like maybe that thing, uh, is quite useful. So never mind what it's doing with that uh, in order to classify the image, but um, that, I think we could call it like a feature vector, uh, can be very useful for lots of other uh, tasks. Um, and especially if, you, if you're trying to solve a problem uh, where you don't have a lot of data. Okay, so if you can train a convolutional neural network on a large data set and then chop off those last few layers, um, you can transfer that to a task where you have uh, maybe less data. So this is basically the idea of uh, learning these, these useful representations of images. Um, so this is a diagram of what I just said. So on the left, we have the, um, uh, the sort of standard CNN with the convolutional layers and then an output uh, classification layer. If we remove that last part and we just keep the convolution 
the layers as they are, and we stick a new uh, output layer there, which can be different in dimension, um, and just basically then train this part on our new data set. Um, this turns out to work quite well. Okay, so in some sense, this, this um, uh, convolutional base, as I call it, maps the image to some sort of useful space where uh, uh, we can do all sorts of things with images, like for example, classify them or uh, do other things. So here's just an example of how we've used this. This was quite a while ago. Um, so that's, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but that's an aerial photo of uh, somewhere in the bush. And uh, the challenge here is how many elephants are in this image? Okay. Um, I can't really remember the correct answer. I think it's like five or six, but they're like really hidden. Um, so we trained a, basically an a elephant detector uh, on data like this, and we, uh, it was a very simple approach. We simply uh, trained a two-class classifier and ran a, uh, like a search window across the uh, image, and we want to classify every window as being an elephant or not an elephant. And uh, so there are some of the data uh, that we trained on. So our two classes, elephants and not elephants. And then um, with this transfer learning idea, we uh, managed to do this quite well. Um, you might, n I don't know if this is clear, but uh, these examples here are purposefully chosen so that they kind of look like elephants. So this is like, uh, you can think of this as sort of difficult examples. And it's quite nice that you can um, uh, basically, while you're training, you can pick uh, examples of this negative class uh, in such a way that your trainer or uh, your, your um, classifier uh, improves. So um, I'll come back to this, this idea a bit later. Okay. Um, of course, what you can also do is uh, you can complement the image data with additional modalities. Um, so here's an example of a, a project we're working on to classify uh, proteas. Um, so in the Western Cape, we have this amazing biodiversity uh, called the Feinbos, and there's like 100 and some 80 or something species of proteas, but they're very hard to identify. So um, sometimes uh, two different uh, species are more closely, or visually they look more closely than, um, uh, what did I say? Uh, uh, examples from the same class, yeah. So um, it's it's what we call a fine-grained image uh, recognition problem, and uh, we combined the visuals or the images with things like uh, GPS location, elevation, because this um, has a huge effect in, on which types of proteas you can find, and then also time of the year because they flower at different times of the year, and uh, there's some of the results we're currently getting by combining these two modalities, okay. And now the problem with um, the sort of standard image classification is that we really don't have uh, semantic similarity among our, our different labels. This is something that Andrew also mentioned. Um, and if we want to uh, add a new class uh, to our classifier, we would have to retrain uh, typically with thousands of examples. Um, and this really isn't uh, how humans seem to uh, do it. Um, so the question really is, is can we somehow uh, incorporate uh, meaning to the labels? Um, and if we can do that, then we can maybe start answering uh, questions like these. So, um, if, uh, if I, and I is now maybe the machine, see something large and gray with big ears, what is it? I mean, you can kind of guess what that could be. Um, or if I ask a question, what do animals look like? So um, we have this uh, sort of super category animals with lots of examples. Uh, are there shared features um, that we can uh, discover among all the examples? 
And then this, uh, this ties to some work I did in a robotics group a few years ago. So they were also interested in, in um, actions that can be performed with different objects. Um, so I see a round and red object being eaten. Uh, what could it be? Or uh, I have not seen this object before. So this is like the zero shot learning case. Uh, what can I do with it? So again, if I can somehow uh, just um, uh, recognize features of this object and link them to features of objects that I have seen before, maybe there's a uh, relation uh, in the actions that I can perform. Okay. And to answer these sort of questions, uh, you can look at uh, what's called attributes or visual attributes. So this, these would be uh, sort of semantic concepts um, like uh, this image there on the right is furry and striped and has eyes and it's young and, and so on. Um, and then you can also uh, have other things like physical attributes, uh, categorical attributes. So this, this hierarchy of um, classes. Uh, you could also have uh, relative attributes. So you can say that uh, this tiger is more striped than I am. Um, and you can then do reasoning with, with, that, with that information. And then also these, what we call affordances, so these are the actions that we can do uh, with objects. So you can define all these things and uh, you can then try to uh, find relations between them. So it's uh, this idea of relations. Um, so there are a few examples. So if we see a tail, then it's likely that the object also has a head. Uh, spiky object is perhaps not touchable and so on. Um, and it's quite key that these things are um, sort of soft relations or statistical uh, because we don't, yeah, I mean, when we do reasoning, we really want to do it in a probabilistic way. Um, and the other thing is that we also want is that we uh, must be able to learn these things from uh, examples. Um, now, one way that you can learn this from data is that you have, again, lots of examples of images with certain attributes and you can train classifiers to find all these things. Um, another approach would be a bit more unified. So you can build this, uh, what we call a knowledge base or a knowledge graph. So uh, you basically have all these attributes and um, affordances and relations between them and you basically try to learn these uh, links. So maybe an apple is edible and it's round and it's rollable. And uh, so you can build this really uh, rich um, uh, uh, structure on all, on all your objects and attributes and things. Okay. And then of course also associate uh, probabilities with these things. Okay. And once, you have, once you've learned something like this, you can now start to answer those, those kinds of questions. What do animals look like? So you look for all the objects that you've classed as animals and you look for shared uh, attributes. Okay. Or of course you can do uh, inference tasks or you can, if you observe some of these attributes, you can uh, condition this thing and um, maybe uh, build a distribution over which objects it could be. Okay. Another thing that a student of mine is working on is this idea of visual relationship detection. So you have an image and you detect a few objects um, and you don't only want to know what the objects are, you also want to know how they are interacting uh, in the scene. So you might want to build up something like this, which is called a scene graph. So in this case, we have a man feeding a horse. The horse is eating from the bucket. The man is holding the bucket. Man is wearing glasses. So these blue things are the objects and then the red things are the relations between them. And uh, what we're currently also looking at is to inject uh, these ideas of attributes um, as additional inputs. And then also what is quite useful is uh, to use language models to uh, help with this task. So for example, from uh, if we can train some sort of model on language, we could say that, well, it's, uh, it's quite unlikely for a horse to be feeding a man. So if our system thinks that, then we should tell it, well, you better be very sure about that. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the idea of rescaling these, these triplets. Okay. Um, and you can do it in quite a nice Bayesian way as well. 
The problem here, of course, is that we are still uh, limited in um, uh, sort of the types of objects and attributes and things that we've seen in our training data. So um, with these kinds of techniques, um, uh, the, the uh, types of objects and the words that we can use in our reasoning is limited by our training set. Um, and so, well, one thing that we can do with, with this example is uh, it's also a type of zero-shot learning. So if we, you can imagine if we have uh, lots of objects and lots of possible uh, relationships uh, combinatorically, there's quite a lot of things that we can um, potentially model, and we might not have training data for that. But what uh, can we, what, what, what we can do with things like this is, um, let's say, for example, I have seen a man feeding a horse, and I'm now faced with a picture of a man feeding an elephant. Uh, if I can detect that elephant is an elephant and the man is a man, uh, maybe there is knowledge from my examples of a man feeding a horse to tell me that this man is feeding an elephant. So uh, there is some, some um, scope for, for the zero-shot type approach, but I'm still um, limited in that I have to know what a man is and I have to know what a horse is and I have to know what an elephant is. Okay, so if I see an image of a new object that I've never seen before, then I'm in trouble. And this is really where, the, where this idea of uh, semantic embedding comes from. So um, before we get to that, let me say just quickly about word embeddings in case you're not familiar with that. So the idea is that we represent words. So these are words in English uh, or in any language that humans understand um, as vectors in a space that captures semantic similarity. Um, now, what this basically means is that two vectors that are close in this space must also be close in meaning. Um, and now, of course, the meaning of meaning is uh, something that we have to be clear on. Um, so there's this idea of uh, distributional semantics. So the idea is that if we look at a large corpus of text, then um, words we can sort of use the context of words to discover their meaning. So uh, words that are surrounded by similar words tend to have a similar meaning. Okay. Um, and there's a quick example just to show you that, but I think I'll skip that one. And then there's also this idea of a skip gram model where um, this is what word 2 vec is, is uh, based on. So um, again, we have uh, we can think of we have a large body of text, and we're going to sort of move a window through this text and uh, look at all the words that are um, close to the one that we're interested in. So in this case, we're interested in that word. In this case, in this one, that, and that. And uh, we create this training set where we're going to try and use the blue word to predict uh, these other words. So this is the input and that's the output. This is the input and that's the output. And then this is the input, that's the output, this is the input, that's the output, and so on. So we build this huge training set and then we train a neural network on that. And uh, we're not really interested in uh, the network's ability to um, predict those words. Again, it's more about the network's ability to embed um, uh, the input into a space that makes this prediction possible. So we're training this ne uh, network and then we're just throwing away the last layer and interested in that, that um, final embedding. Okay, some applications to this that we're currently working on. The one is in a sort of formal uh, AI, formal logic and ontology um, to see if we can use uh, these word embeddings to uh, train uh, deep neural networks to do uh, things similar to, to formal um, ontologies. Another uh, project that I'm quite excited about is that we're also um, training multilingual word embedding. So we're not using only English, but uh, all the languages of South Africa. And um, there's a project with uh, PrayCal.org and the National Department of Health. Um, of uh, trying to automate parts of uh, this Mom Connect system. So Mom Connect is a is a uh, help desk service for uh, mothers in South Africa 
specifically those that uh, might not have access to uh, healthcare. Um, and they can basically ask questions uh, in, on WhatsApp uh, in any of the 11 languages um, and then get an answer from a medical professional. Unfortunately, at the moment, the, um, the median response time is something like 20 hours. So they're, they're really, they don't, just don't have enough people to, to respond to all the queries. Uh, so we're looking at ways that we can try to automate the, uh, at least parts of it. Um, and word embeddings is, is quite useful for that. Okay, so now the question is, so we can um, sort of embed images to this useful space, then we can then uh, use it for various different tasks. We can also embed words into a space where uh, similar in meaning words are close together uh, in that space. Uh, so the idea of visual semantic embedding is just basically to combine the, those two things. Um, and if we can do that, then the idea is that we can scale this visual recognition uh, to um, also be able to identify classes we haven't seen in the training set um, through the, uh, semantic connections. And the approach really is, is quite simple, or at least the... the um, of course, people are uh, proposing all kinds of fancy things, but the basic approach is, is quite simple. Um, and that is that we, are, uh, we can train this um, semantic, semantically useful word embedding space, and then we're just going to try and map images into that space. So uh, images of a red car should go to the words red core or the concept of a red core. And uh, there's a nice visualization of one way that we can do this. Um, so we basically take this uh, vision model. So this is just a, the standard uh, image classification model. Um, and we take our uh, word embedding model so the word embedding model takes, us, takes a word as input and tries to predict an, uh, a word that is nearby in its context. Um, and then we basically uh, remove this uh, last layer from the vision component. And we, of course, with a uh, skip gram model, we're not interested in the output. We're interested in this uh, embedding uh, operation. So what we then do is we connect these two and we say that we're going to fine tune the vision uh, model uh, to map these images to the same, um, the same uh, word embedding space. Okay. So of course, to train this, we need images with labels. So we take the label and we map it to the uh, word embedding space and then we fine tune the vision component to take the image to the same space. Okay. Maybe then just a note on how we can train this. So uh, previously our model took an input image X and maps it to like a, a one not encoding vector Y, but now instead the model that we're trying to train will map the image to a embedding of that word vector, uh, of that um, one not uh, label vector, okay. And previously we just basically tried to minimize the error, so over a training set, so the difference between what our model is doing and what we want the model to be doing, but um, it turns out that in this case it makes more sense to do this uh, slightly more complicated loss function, or to minimize this loss function. Um, so this is basically we have the dissimilarity there, and then also what we call a hinge loss, uh, which um, this is uh, that concept of a support vector machine. So we're trying to not only map uh, images to where we want them to go, we also try to do that in a way that um, things that are not associated to that image must be mapped sufficiently far away. So we want this, this, it's this idea of a margin in, a, in an SVM. Um, 
So what we can do is uh, we can sum over a bunch of uh, images that are not equal to the current one. And uh, basically uh, have this extra term that should ensure that um, those images are mapped to points far uh, sufficiently far away from, from the current one. And if you kind of stare, and then there's also a max there with zero. If you look at this for a while, you'll see that um, when we minimize this, the idea is basically that we will uh, minimize that thing. So this thing will uh, uh, go to zero and uh, the uh, error we're making on, uh, um, this isn't right. Oh yeah, yeah. so, so the, uh, um, the negative samples as we call them must be uh, greater than uh, the loss we're making on a positive sample plus that margin, okay. Um, of course, this can be quite expensive because this says you have to, so we're summing over all our training samples and then we're also summing for each of those, summing over all the samples that is not the current one. So this is really ex uh, expensive, but there are efficient ways that we can sample from uh, these ones. So we don't have to uh, sum over all of them, but only a sample. And again, we can pick those sample in a clever way that uh, we um, basically pick uh, hard samples um, to uh, optimize the, the minimization. Oh, then just a note, actually we don't, usually we don't use this uh, squared loss, we use a cosine distance, it just works a bit better. Um, and then as I said, there are efficient ways that we can do this uh, negative sampling, okay. Oh, by the way, this is also called the triplet loss, so, um, if, and this is actually something that also applies to uh, image recognition. So um, instead of having a, an image and a label, we now have an image and a label and a negative sample. So we're saying the image must go to the label, but also far away from the negative sample. Okay. So let me just go over a few applications of this. So we now basically now have this ability to map images to a space where we also have this um, uh, semantic um, ability with words. So this is just an example from Fast uh, AI. So um, I think this is uh, basically trained on the ImageNet data. So we can create basically an average of the embedding of the word engine and boat, and then ask for images that are close to that uh, concept. And these are some of the images that, that it returns. Um, so this is nice that we now in this space where we can do these sort of vector operations on semantic concepts and ask uh, uh, between text and uh, images. Uh, and similarly here for sail and boat. And then um, another thing of course that we can do is uh, image captioning or also video captioning. Um, so this is a model that uh, my student uh, Simba uh, presented a poster on yesterday. Um, so again, we can um, uh, take these images. This is a video, uh, frames from a video and um, a uh, corresponding sentence of words describing this and we can map it to a common uh, space. Uh, another thing is of course then zero shot learning. So um, now that we're in a space where um, we have lots of words, uh, but not necessarily training examples of all these words, uh, we can um, take an, let's say we take an image like this. Uh, this type of object has never been seen uh, in training the vision uh, component, but if we now map this to the embedding space and just ask for the five closest words, um, it actually successfully picks up uh, what that is. Okay, that's compared to if we just uh, try to find the closest labels uh, of the uh, from the training set. Okay. Another thing is, and this is also what we're currently working on with this Protea project, is 
to do fine grain classification. So here you can see two examples of um, these, this and this are two different species of uh, albatross, but they're very similar. Um, and we have this text uh, description of each. So if you read through this text, you'll see that uh, it basically gives us these very useful uh, visual features that discriminates between these two classes. So if we can uh, somehow use this with image data to um, uh, train a very powerful classifier. What is also nice about this text is um, that uh, there is also uh, these ideas of attributes and relations. Um, so we can use that as well. Okay. And then the last application I just want to show you is uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, Hermann Kamper, also at Stellenbosch. Um, and he's basically um, uh, using not images and text, but images and speech data uh, and mapping that to a common uh, space. So basically what happens here is that there's an image that uh, goes through, uh, we can also think of this as, as kind of an attribute detector. So it says that this image has a hat and a man and a shirt. And then um, in this particular data set, there is also a spoken description of this image. So it's an image and speech pair. And uh, this um, speech is taken through a neural network, gives some output. And then the idea is to train this part of the, or this neural network so that that output matches that output. So what's happening here is actually we're embedding the speech into a uh, the representation space of images. And once that's trained, we remove this image part and now we can input new speech. And when we see what co what's coming out here, we can, uh, so each of these outputs is associated with a label there. So this is a way that we can um, make sense of speech um, in that way. So we can figure out that somewhere in this speech, uh, there's mention of a man and a hat and a shirt, for example. Okay. And the nice thing about this is we don't need any transcriptions of this speech. So for training uh, low resource languages, this can be quite useful. Of course, we need images associated with that. Okay. Um, I'm a bit quicker than I thought I would be. Uh, one thing that I just want to, as like a final thought, say is that, um, and I think this is also part of our uh, mission at the Indaba and the Indaba Xs, is um, this idea of biases. And I think it's very important that uh, when we work with text and vision, um, it's very important to think about um, ways that we can avoid um, perpetuating biases. So there's a nice paper that, uh, um, appeared in Science uh, Journal uh, a couple of years ago that found that, this, that actually these embeddings do uh, tend to absorb uh, biases. So for example, the um, uh, concept of a doctor would be associated with males and nurse with females. And that's really what we don't want. So um, I think we have to also, when we do this type of work, we have to think about that. Um, and I just want to quickly say thanks to my, the students in, in my group um, working on these sorts of things. And then kind of as a final example, uh, I thought to myself, uh, image captioning, uh, zero shot learning, is there maybe an image of an object that will have no training data that we can try to caption and see if we can um, uh, really do zero shot learning? So I thought, well, Let's see what happens on that image. Uh, so we have no other examples of that object, right? And that's the best that uh, those two systems could do. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. Um, great talk. Thanks for that. On the matter of bias, do you think that mixing visual and textual data might give us a better opportunity to reduce bias in these sets. We might be able to tell if a, like if a property of an image suggests it's more likely to have bias to flag or something like that. 
Yeah, honestly, I don't have the answer to <laughs> to solve that problem. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I mean the bias is so inherent in the data that you that you give it. So, yeah. I've got two questions. My first question is based on an example that you presented uh, about identifying the number of elephants from an image. So I wish to understand the mechanism. Maybe if you can expound more on the mechanism that you use to do that. And then uh, the second, uh, maybe a question, or you get give some clarification. Um, there are different models for feature representation, but I maybe I pick on two, like bug of visual words and the Fisher factors. Now, which one could you recommend? Like, is most ideal for, you know, identifying this semantics for to label like an, a feature or an image um, in an sorry uh, one of the object in an image yeah thank you yeah okay so the first question was uh, explain this better um, so basically um, okay maybe I can first say that uh, using color images is maybe not the best way to solve this I mean elephants are hard to spot uh, so we also tried this with uh, infrared uh, but the problem there is that uh, you have to send out the plane really early in the morning before the ground heats. I mean, this Afri in Africa, the things get hot in the day. So um, that actually turned out to not, like, after 8 o'clock in the morning, everything is too hot and you just don't pick up uh, animals. Um, that was the one problem. And the other problem was that the interference with the airplane's engine really messed up the, <laughs> the infrared images. So uh, basically here the idea was that we manually um, marked a bunch of elephants in these images and then we built a training set. So um, I'm not sure if that's even clear, but uh, that's an elephant there and there's another one, there's two there. Um, so we um, basically uh, took a whole bunch of examples of uh, elephant cutouts from these images, and then also examples of anything else. Uh, and we fine-tuned a um, convolutional neural network to predict, uh, given a section of the image, does it contain an elephant or not? And then we also did this thing called hard negative mining. So after training, we look at what did it get wrong? And so it thought that this was an elephant. We know it's not. So we then retrain it, uh, basically including this one as a negative example. So we sort of iteratively build a more difficult training set so that, that with the idea that it should improve. Yeah. And that's basically how it worked. Yeah. Uh, you had a second question, but I kind of forgot what that was. I just picked on two models, uh, like the bug of visual words and the support vector. Uh, not support vector, but the Fisher vector. And I was trying to get, you know, one use, uses statistics and the other one uses like the gradient. So for you to label object within an image, which one do you think is most appropriate of the two? Um, yeah, so I mean, these days people tend to just uh, train a neural network to do that. Um, <laughs> so it's been a while since I've looked at uh, those other ones, you know, like bag of words or uh, Fisher vectors and that. You know. People tend not to use them, really. Um, it depends, of course. I mean, a CNN needs a lot of data. So if you don't need a lot of, of if you don't have a lot of data, then maybe a visual bag of words is the way to go. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of talk about causal reasoning and, and, and causal inference. Um, do you feel handicapped? by not, I don't know if you're using causal inference, but do you feel handicapped in when you perform this research um, by not having a, co a causal model? Well, I mean, I don't fully understand causal models yet, so <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm handicapped by that. Um, but yeah, no, this, um, that's definitely a, a very interesting way forward, yeah, and we hope to, first of all, understand them and then start using them. Uh, yeah, but that's, I mean, yeah, of course, that's, that would be very nice if we could do that. Yeah. Hi, I just have a more, 
more of a technical question, I suppose, with this, uh, the elephant scanning problem. I'm just wondering, because you said you used a sliding window to pick up where the elephants are. I'm just curious what the approach you guys used to, for, were the sliding windows overlapping to some extent? And then how did you deal with potential double counting of the same item on the overlap? And was that manually checked kind of afterwards? Or does the thing carefully understand when it's picked up the same elephant twice across two images? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's, I mean, that wasn't easy. So baby elephants tend to stick close to mother elephants. And we just, I think we didn't have enough data to really uh, do the counting to that sort of granularity. Unfortunately, also a window like this would typically just count it as one. Um, and um, yeah, I'm trying to remember about overlaps and that. I think we had we had some over, oh, yeah, I can't remember the details, but I think there might have been some overlap in the sliding and that some. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that you you typically have so in an image like that. So I chose this image because it actually contains a few elephants, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but uh, so your um, your what's it? Just trying to think now. So this was basically part of a, a big project to try and count all the elephants in Africa. Um, so again, the idea was that we, can we, what can we do to, op, to automate this in any way? Because um, uh, I think, let me just, yeah, so basically the idea here, as, as far as I remember, was that we wanted uh, high recall so we didn't want to miss any elephants, but we were okay with the low precision because people could have could check. So, I mean, with an image like that, it's difficult to spot the elephants by eye. But if you can reduce it to, okay, here are six images where I think elephants are, then you can quickly one, two, three, there are four elephants and then you're done. Yeah. So I think the, ultimately the idea here was to uh, help the human. Um, so I'm quite interested in the example of uh, the semantic classification with the man feeding the horse. Mm. And it's, so it sounds like you first do object detection, then try and find out uh, the relationship between them. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you've done any work on just classifying, say, the verb or, or the predicate rather than um, first identifying objects and then um, finding the relationship between them. Uh... So an example, I suppose, would be classifying this as feeding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we haven't really done that specifically, but it's certainly something you can you can do. <laughs> yeah, there are some really nice data sets out there with like the hundreds of thousands of images and bounding boxes and relations and attributes and captions. Like, yeah, so you can. You can really, whatever you can think of, you can try and do. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I'm actually not even sure if that's an easier or a harder problem because uh, there is such a strong um, link between the objects and the actions. So uh, you kind of, if you do both, they can help each other. Um, and if you can then have a language model added to that, then yeah. Um, so one thing that I can say here is, of course, let's say you have uh, 10 possible objects and 10 po uh, possible objects on that side and maybe uh, five different actions, then you already have uh, 500 possible um, triplets, like uh, object, subject, um, what's it, subject, predicate, object. Um, so what we actually do, we don't train a 500 uh, output neural network. We train one with um, basically three types of outputs. One to identify the first object, one to identify the second object, and one to identify the predicate. So you could then just ignore the two objects and just focus on the predicate. Yeah.